Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and I'm happy as always to be alongside one of my favourite people of all time, Joe Stanley. Hello, Joe. Awesome to see you, Darcy. I do love doing this show week in, week out. I'm looking forward to today's show as we're celebrating one of my all-time favourite things, women. Well, can't argue with that, Joe. and I've got some very special women in my life, as we all do, as you know. Yes, Tuesday, March the 8th is International Women's Day and I think it's a really important day to put our arms around all the women that we love, respect and admire and also to acknowledge that there's still a fair way to go on the road to gender equality. We've always been big supporters right here on the House of Wellness of girls getting into STEM, and I see that flow through into the confidence in my daughter and just how the world is open no matter what it is, business, politics, starting your own business, it feels as though it's a much more uh, open environment for the young women coming through. Now, this is a great story, Joe. I've been wanting to talk to you about this for ages. Starting your own business is tough, but you've done it one of the newest entrepreneurs in the country, and we're incredibly proud of you, Joe. what Aww. you are doing with Broad Radio. Can you tell us a bit about it? Because it's such a passion project for you and a, a great achievement. Thanks, Darcy. That's really lovely. It is a massive thing. I never imagined I'd call myself an entrepreneur, that's for <laughs> sure. But I am creating a radio network for women by women called Broad Radio. It's the first in Australia. And I'm doing that because I really see that there's a gap in live radio for women who want to hear stories and news and conversations that are relevant to them. It's like there's lots of podcasts, but you and I, we love live radio. We understand that it connects people and I think that it's a real opportunity for women to connect with each other and feel really understood and, and to really support each other to live our fullest lives. So, yes, we're a start-up. We're very early stage. So at the moment, uh, we're building an app so everybody will be able to listen wherever they go, but at the moment we're broadcasting on Facebook. Well, Joe, you've had some incredible guests on Broad Radio already, but I'm really looking forward to your next guest, who's truly inspirational on every level. She's an author, personal coach, Kemi Nectarpil. Uh, I have had a dream of interviewing Kemi for a very long time. She's worked through her own adversity to become one of the most powerful coaches and speakers. She trained in India as a yoga teacher. She trained with the world-renowned Dr Brené Brown on courage and leadership. She pioneered the raw food movement in Australia and her passion is to support women to own their voices and step into their power. She is really a remarkable person and here's a little of what Kemi has to say. I'm very blessed to work with incredibly successful women in many areas. And when I say success, I don't just mean within their work. I mean, you know, they have families that are working or their sense of self. But within that, as women, we have to operate within a system every single day that in some ways tells us that we are not small enough, that we are too loud, that we are too aggressive. And then add to that as well the intersectionality of colour for me or for women that have disabilities or people that are neurodivergent. We constantly hear the message that we're not quite good enough yet. And I think, yes, it doesn't matter where we are um, on the spectrum. It affects us every day. And, Kemi, I think one of the other things that the pandemic really shone a light on was the burden on women, the mental burden, the mental load, the mm -hmm. workload, both within and outside of the home. Mm -hmm. And I, so I sort of think, okay, yes, we can step into our power and you talk about power of agency, but if you can't walk away from your life or if you can't actually set a boundary that day, how mm -hmm. are women to respond when you feel like actually I'm drowning? How can I feel any sense of power in this state right now? Personally, I think there's a power in owning I am drowning. And actually what a lot of women do is that we fall into this idea that we have to be good, that we have to look as if we have it together all the time, that we're the good wife, the good daughter, the good sister, the good friend, the good everything. So it's powerful to even say, I am drowning. And I would say the next power move is then to share that with someone. And then the next is to ask for the support that you need. That is power. I know in my earlier days... I would, you know, have this kind of veneer of being very strong and I was kind of invulnerable and, you know, you know, just kind of like, I can do it all and, you know, if you want a job done properly, do it yourself because I was kind of raised that way. 
And then I realized over time that actually it made me feel incredibly isolated and incredibly lonely. And when I started to practice saying to people, I'm not going well, like I'm struggling, I need help, that that actually created deeper and more powerful connections with the women that I surrounded myself with. And I can honestly say that now within my friendship groups, and even as a female entrepreneur with other female entrepreneurs, that we can call each other in tears saying, mm. I cannot believe this happened. But we can also call each other with great success and celebration about something that has worked within our life or within our work. So I think even in some ways, we're breaking the status quo as women to say, I don't have it all together all the time. I need help and I need support. Das, I just love that Kemi is all about helping women understand their strengths and power that we all have inside us, regardless of circumstance, and so that we can then mentor each other to do the same. I just really love that so much as a message. Such a great purpose-driven uh, space that you and Kemi are in, so well done again. Yeah, thanks. And that when you empower women, you change society towards a more compassionate, healthy, thriving community. That's what International Women's Day is all about. Don't miss the extended interview next Tuesday on Broad Radio. And while Joe's giving a voice to women on the airways, up next we meet the women who are all screaming quite literally their worries away. You need to see this one. We'll be back after this. Before the break, we heard how Joe's newest venture, Broad Radio, is giving women a voice. And I must admit, I love seeing it in my 16-year-old daughter, Sienna, who's pretty fiery, pretty direct. She stands up for what she believes in. But it's a great thing, Joan. I know you've created a lot of that, so well done. Well, I'm very passionate about the fact that women have a lot to say. We don't really want to be quiet and polite anymore. We <laughs> want to be heard, but often the platforms aren't there to actually say what, what we want to say. So hence I'm creating Broad Radio. But I tell you, we're living in different times. You've got to add social media into the mix, juggling kids and work, perhaps you're managing elderly parents as well. And all of that pressure just ends up overwhelming us and and women are carrying a massive mental load. Sometimes you just want to release it all and scream. Well, it's why we've seen break rooms are popular these days. People go along and actually swing a baseball bat and <laughs> smash a few plates to relieve the tension. We've covered that before on the yes, show. Yes, well, there's actual science behind the power of a good scream. It definitely makes you feel better when you're frustrated and it all gets too much. Or if you're a little bit frazzled, you're time poor, you're sleep deprived, mum who just needs to yell, just give me a break. <laughs> So in my community, I work with moms and I'm talking with them all the time. And during the pandemic, a lot of our conversations were around all the huge emotions we were feeling, fear, anxiety, grief around the loss of, you know, being able to provide our kids with a sense of safety or a music class or, you know, a birthday party with friends. And after conversation after conversation where I would say, you know, I think we just need to go into a field and scream because that's really all we can do right now. And my clients and community saying back to me, okay, let's do it. <laughs> I, I decided to do it. There was a structure to the screaming, wasn't there? I did uh, a series of screams. Uh, the first one was a regular scream. Uh, and because it was the middle of the night, or we're not the middle of the night, but dark, uh, dark on the East Coast in the middle of winter, I have these unicorn wands from my, my kids that uh, are, they're like little beacons. And so I use those as cues. So when I lifted them up, I cued an inhale for the whole group. And then the first scream on the exhale was a regular scream. <laughs> the second scream was a profanity scream. All the swears that you've been holding. <laughs> so that was a good one. Um, the third one, so it was a free-for-all in one of the screams I did, but then uh, the most recent ones, I actually did a third one for all the things that have been cancelled. That was a very loud one for, for many of the women. <laughs> the fourth one was for people that really needed to be there, who wanted to be there and couldn't be. So moms that might've been in quarantine or couldn't get out of bedtime. And then the fifth one uh, was a healthy competition scream. It was who could scream the loudest. Well, I love it because as a mother, 
I can acknowledge who hasn't gone and screamed into the linen cupboard at some point. That is the feedback I've gotten, honestly, is, oh my gosh, I've been doing this in closets, in cars, into pillows, especially from an older generation of moms that reached out to me and, and they felt heard and, and their screams felt normalized in a way. But I think what is, is so interesting is, is that, you know, the healing that has come from the scream um, is, and the permission that it's given to moms is just been, it's been incredible. But also when we bottle up something like anger and don't find a deliberate way of releasing it, it can come out in ways that we're not proud of. A hundred percent. It's got to come out somewhere, right? Yeah. Anyway, somewhere. And, and oftentimes, you know, with parents, it comes out at your kids in some way, or it comes out at your spouse, your partner, if you have one. Um, it comes out at the person at the coffee shop because you just, you're so pent up. You can't help it, right? You're not in a grounded place and you're really going from that triggered triggered spot and so you're right you know it, it it catches up with you and what kind of feedback did you get from the women there oh it keeps coming you know uh I feel lighter I didn't I want a big one is I didn't know how badly I needed that I didn't know how amazing that would feel I think a lot of people go into it being like well this is kind of funny you know we'll, we'll see how this goes and it catches them off guard well, Sarah, I know that this story and this very simple activity that you ran has just gone around the world. Have you been surprised by how much it has resonated with people? I have and I haven't, right? It's been amazing, you know, to be talking to Australia um, and to be talking to Germany and uh, all over the States. Uh, it's been amazing. And yet I get it. Well, I feel deeply validated, so I thank you for <laughs> what you did, Sarah. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> well, there are two schools of thought. One is that rage and anger are negative emotions and should be minimised. On the flip side, both can be powerful motivators. And in a lot of ways, Darcy, if you're feeling this rage or anger, it's got to go somewhere. Well, it's just an emotion that we all experience yeah. and it can be really useful. It's pretty useful playing footy sometimes. It? It's <laughs> probably fairly useful if, you know, someone's going to break into your house and you need it to protect <laughs> someone. You probably want to tap into a bit of an anger. I think that's the problem. We try and suppress these emotions. Mm. Not so good sometimes parenting, but if you can deal with the emotions and understand when they're appropriate, maybe that's a better way to think about it. Well, one thing that riles many people in the new pandemic normal world is face masks. We'll get a refresh of course on that a little bit later. Yes, plus the motivation behind another of our great sporting females. That's right after this. So we're talking gender equality to mark International Women's Day, which brings me to my first love of sport. And we've seen huge advances, but women here are still underrepresented pretty much across the board, Joe, but particularly in the management side of things. Well, a study from Victoria University found that just 24% of Australian sporting CEOs were women and at the Rio Olympics, only 9% of the Aussie team's coaches were female. And, you know, it matters not just because women and girls deserve the same opportunities to follow their dreams as boys and men, but also because we know, and you're passionate about leadership, Das, that when you have diversity in leadership, the whole team benefits from that. Yeah, one of the great uh, pleasures in recent times for me is going back on the board of my old football club. Our president is a legend, Kylie Watson-Wheeler, is the head of Disney as her day job. She's doing incredible things. There's also a big push right now to get more women both playing sport and into those leadership roles. The federal government has announced a raft of new programs and ways to help make that happen. That is a great step forward. We need those women for tomorrow's sports stars to look up to. Role models like Victorian young gun Monique Conti. The 22-year-old is a champion basketballer and footy player, meaning she's literally keeping a whole lot of balls in the air. I started basketball when I was about around five years old and then picked up a football when I was about eight. And ever since back then, I've been juggling both. 
when I started playing AFL football, there was no girls' teams, so I started with the boys. And you'd go out there and you'd have boys in your ear saying, this is a boy sport, you shouldn't be playing here, like, I'm going to hurt you and all that sort of stuff. I think I found some sort of drive in that and I was, like, wanting to prove those people wrong and let them know that, no, just because I'm a girl doesn't mean I can't be playing the same sport as you. And I sort of just let my football do the talking and I'd have been doing that to this day. Jacobson just chips it high towards the wing. Zanka tries to get there. Conti at the front, huge mark for the dogs. Monique Conti's determination to defy expectations has come to define her sporting career. By the age of 18, she was following both her passions professionally as a star player for the Western Bulldogs and the Melbourne Boomers. Trying to juggle AFL women's and WNBL my first year alone was extremely challenging. It was just a challenge to try and figure out how am I going to do this? Do I have to sacrifice one or the other? But then, you know, it got to a point where I was like, I don't want to give up one or the other. I enjoy them way too much. So I sort of sat down with my manager, sat down with my parents, sat down with anyone that was going to support me and try to figure out how I was going to do it. A lot of the sacrifices that I had to make back then was the social life. I had to not go to a lot of things or, you know, see a lot of people just because I was so busy and I had to prioritise my recovery and my sleep and my food and all that sort of stuff. Huntington goes to an open goal square. Conti runs back on it. She's got a metre on Heath. Heath does well, but can't stop Moncon kicking the goal. Despite an overwhelming schedule in her first AFLW season, Monique managed to score best on ground in the Bulldogs Premiership win just a couple of weeks after playing in the WNBL Finals. In 2020, she was recruited by the Tigers for their inaugural AFLW season. Richmond's an amazing club. Felt like family as soon as I stepped foot in here for the first time. There was just something about Richmond that really drew me to them and every time I walk in here, I feel like I'm really a part of something. After four years juggling basketball and football at an elite level, last year Monique decided it was finally time to focus all her energy on one sport. That was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't um, eat properly. I was just um, crying every night to my mom and you know the, my friends and just didn't know what to do. But I really had to think about myself for once and think where am I gonna enjoy myself and just be happy, which environment? is gonna fit me best. I was like, oh, I think I need to give footy a crack this year. Ponty, another handball for her. Richmond's on a great journey, they're going places. I wanna be a big part of that. So as soon as I made that decision, it was like a huge weight was off my shoulders. So that's when I knew it was the right one. I think one thing that drives me every day is knowing that Myself and a lot of other girls are really strong role models for young girls coming through and personally going through hell and, and trying to prove people wrong for a few years, just doing it and, and going through so much and then coming out the other end of it. It's all so rewarding when you look back and you see girls that look up to and, and parents telling you that my daughter's doing two sports as well. So I think the special part about it is knowing that there's girls looking up to us and they want to be like us and we're out there and we're showing them that they can do it. They are one of the premiership favourites. And you had Liv Purcell, who's come across from the Cats. Oh, my Conti! Something out of nothing, a bit of brilliance. What a finish. Now, Das, I can barely catch one ball of any kind, <laughs> but I imagine it's a pretty difficult thing to choose one sport over another. But what's incredible is how some people can just swap between sports and be equally good at both. No, it's Were incredible, you able that? to go from footy to...? Well, I'd like to say that was the case, <laughs> but uh, I was a pretty passionate young cricketer as a kid, but always loved footy. I mean, Erin Phillips stands out to me from an AFLW point of view. Yeah. She joined... Basketball as a youngster, went on to be a superstar in the WNBA and then came back with the Opals and won Olympic medals. And then on her return to the world of AFLW, she was just incredible. What a star she is. Amazing. What about Elise Perry, one of the best female cricketers on the planet, who also played football with the Matildas, and I think she scored three goals at the 2011 World Cup. I mean, how talented can you be? She's a gun. Let's continue, <laughs> Joe. Stick around because there's more talent to come on the House of Wellness right after the break.
can't look at makeup if there's no lipstick on. So for me, lipstick is always your final step. After you've completed a flawless base, beautiful eyes, lipstick really polishes the whole look. Australia's number one lip brand, Revlon, have brought out a brand new range, the Colorstay Matte Light Crayons. They deliver a saturated matte color and have a comfortable lightweight formula. It's actually 30% lighter than the average lipstick. There's such great shade offerings here, amazing nude colours that suit your everyday wear, suit any outfit, and then they go all the way up to those vibrant, bright colour reds that look really good on a nighttime makeup or event. Today I've selected the colour Tread Lightly. It's got a nude colour with a little bit of a coral undertone. I love that it has the mango seed oil infused into the formula, makes it so smooth and nourishing on your lips. That's why they've stood the test of time. The Williamstown Surf Life Saving Club in Melbourne's southwestern suburbs is celebrating its 100th year. But for these junior club members, just getting into the ocean is celebration enough. One, two, three, starfish! Starfish Nippers is designed for kids with special needs. It started at Anglesey Surf Club 10 years ago, and now 22 clubs across the country run the program. And with over 35 years in the disability sector, volunteer Veronica Trellor was up for the challenge of bringing it to Williamstown. The normal nipper program, they develop a program over the course of the season, so 10 to 12 weeks. So that comes from Life Saving Australia and Life Saving Victoria, so we can kind of modify it for the kids with disabilities. And we're fortunate here at Williamstown to have the pools, which is, yeah, a bonus. <laughs> with kids ranging from six to 14, each of their needs are individually catered for. The condition needs for us to have one-on-one, -on -one, so especially for the water, for the water safety, to make sure that the kids are all OK. Um, kids that have high needs, it might be two-on-one. So the feedback from the family is really, really positive. They usually have told me about other programs that they've joined in the community. It becomes quite difficult when they're not sure if their kids are enjoying the program. Um, and even for them to have that hour of time out, to have a coffee in peace and not have a kid um, run at them to go, hey, I need this or whatever. But for the proud parents watching on, it's more than just that. It's great to be able to see Ben doing some independent activities. You know, I don't have to be there, so there's somebody else who can help him. He gets a bit of independence, a bit of freedom. Ready, steady, go! Yay! He has trouble with some of the fine motor skills, so some of the other sports like you know, uh, tennis, cricket, football, those sort of things, find quite difficult. But here in the water, you know, he can swim and play around and actually be a part of. It's really special for us to be able to watch Molly doing this independently of us. Um, this is something that is designed for children with special needs and to help them feel included with something that also typically developing kids get to enjoy and it's been absolutely huge for her and us. With options for sand, ocean and pool activities, every one of these starfish can't get enough. I like the flats. I like boards. <laughs> you do races where you get up from your tummy and you have to get the, your toy as quickly as you can. Go! If someone has autism or disability, I have a disability, I recommend going into the starfish groups, not the age groups, because um, the starfish ha groups have way more helpers. But what's clear is that this is a program that works both ways for the kids and the volunteers. I love swimming and I love being around the water, so you want other people to enjoy it too. So the joy on their faces is just reward enough. They're no different to any other child that's part of a life-saving community and they're actually learning some skill sets and, and becoming confident at the beach or at the pool. They don't realise how much they learn, even though they're having fun sometimes. All the time. Can't get them out of the water, as you noticed today. <laughs> One, two, three, stop!
Most Aussies have grown up around the water. More than 80% of us live by or near the coast, and I think most of us take knowing how to swim for granted, but there has been a huge spike in drownings again this summer, Jo. Around 288 people drown in Australia each year. One in four of those are born overseas. People who aren't familiar with Australia's often notorious waterways and oceans. Yeah, plus their swimming skills are often lacking, which is why a group of locals in South Australia have started a swim school for migrants that is already saving lives. I came to Australia 10 years ago in 2009, and I was so excited because all I heard Australia is famous for the beautiful beaches. And really you want to go and dip into the water, but uh, there was a fear of drowning because uh, I read the newspaper, watch TV or Facebook news, we, we know that there's a lot of drownings happening. Growing up in Pakistan, Fahim Sherms never learnt to swim, but he was desperate to overcome his fear. Once you decided to stay in Australia, you build a family, I've realised that uh, knowing water safety is very important. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Bezot, and I'll help you out today for instructing of water safety. Everyone ready to get in? Let's go! Let's go, guys. When I heard about this program, the first thing was that at least I'd be able to go into the water, not, not very deep, but at least I'd be able to float or trade water or do some basic safety things. On the Same Wave is a free program run by Peter Taylor at West Beach, teaching refugees and migrants the basics of water safety. How to go into the water, uh, how to find the right places to go to the water. Obviously, swimming between the flags is where we want everyone to swim, and we teach that as our main aim. But yet, if they can identify what a rip or a gutter and sandbar, then it'll help them in maintaining their own safety once they're down on the beach. But the program doesn't stop there. Our main aim is to teach people how to swim, uh, how to get involved with surf lifesaving and become a surf lifesaver themselves. So then hopefully they can then go back within their own communities and start teaching uh, what's safe to them. Surf instructor Bezard Padarab jumped right in. You've done it. Awesome. Because Iran is a landlocked country, swimming is not very common down there. So, same as many Iranian, I couldn't swim. At Mario River, I was canoeing with a few of my friends. All of a sudden, my canoe turned over, and even though I had a life jacket, I just it was close to drown. And that was another big, head, big kick to my head. I said, right, this is not right. I'm here. I'm surrounded by water. It's good to learn how to swim. But once I learned it, it was much comfortable feeling. I could just be safe. That's why I'm passionate about it, to teach it to other people and share the feeling with them and just make them just enjoy as much as they can. Just check the mask, make sure that there's nothing plugged in the airway. Nope, nothing in there, all good, OK. Patrolling officer Cecile Saidi grew up in a refugee camp in Tanzania. I remember myself that the first time that I saw a beach uh, when we came from outside of the refugee, I was really shocked to see a large body of water in one place. Um, I had never seen that before. So at first it's just mind-blowing. You, you don't associate water with danger because you drink water, you clean yourself in water. So when you see a large body of water in one place, it just blows your mind and then when you get your body in the water and you find yourself in trouble, then, you know, then you learn that, oh, I can actually get in trouble. And so people can, you know, be a bit ignorant about the dangers. Well done. Well done. Well done. With migrants making up nearly 30% of drownings in Australia, Peter knows there's more work ahead. The only real thing that we can do is to be more proactive and get out to the communities uh, and, and try and uh, help them understand the dangers of water. They will not come to us, so we need to be very proactive in getting out to them and, and helping the communities. But for the numerous people Peter has already helped, I think it's a priceless. It is, it is the one of the best uh, moment when you swim in the water, in the ocean, during the summer sunset or early in the morning. It is a priceless. I cannot really put into the words that how happy I am that I know that uh, I know the safety things. It is a huge achievement for me to wearing this clothes. It's an honor serving community. I cannot describe my feeling by words. It's all about its happiness, excitement and how I can help other people. 
The On The Same Wave program has now spread around the nation and it is a wonderful initiative. Joe, From playing safely in the water to face mask safety, we unmask the confusion around the do's and don'ts. That's next. For me, training has changed so much since I hit my 40s. It was all about bicep curls and crunches. For me now, it's about functional movement. At the end of the day, my body's my life. After 30 years in the fitness industry, Shannon Ponton knows how muscles and bones keep us active and what happens to them as we age. Exercise and recovery can be tougher as we lose mass and strength. Thankfully for me, the experts at Nutrisha have created 40 Fit. 40 Fit Muscle and Bone Protein Powder is a specialised nutritional supplement designed for strong bones and healthy functional muscles as we get older. It's loaded with protein and essential nutrients to keep your muscles and bones strong and functioning with all nine essential amino acids for muscle formation, leucine for new muscle growth, vitamin D for bone health and packed with calcium for healthy bone structure. You can make a massive change from 40 onwards. Get your body moving at least 30 to 40 minutes a day, every day. Rectify your diet. Eat healthy, nutritious food with appropriate supplementation. Never give up. Don't worry about the hands of time. Age is only a number. All you need to do is draw a line in the sand and have a go. Personal trainer Shannon Ponton there with the inside word on muscle and bone health, Joe. So walk down any street across the nation and I'm sure you won't get far without seeing one of these. Disposable face masks, now the most common item of rubbish found on the streets. And did you know, Das, 129 billion disposable masks are thrown into landfill every month. It's terrible. It's really bad, but that's not where I'm going with this. At the beginning of the pandemic, masks were recommended but not mandatory. But all that changed as the virus evolved and we were having to wear masks in specific environments, like supermarkets. We saw them all from reusable to disposable, homemade, all kinds of styles and fabrics, multiple or single-layered, surgical, custom-branded, double straps, inbuilt filters, even Diamante encrusted. There's been so much discussion about what is the most effective mask, so we decided to clear it up once and for all. Here's epidemiologist Professor Catherine Bennett from Deakin University. We've seen a progressive adoption of masks now, not only because the evidence is there, but also I think there's been a culture shift around that. We've learnt a lot over time, we've changed our practices, but the virus has also changed, so that's been the challenge. We've got a virus that is more infectious in terms of the most recent variants, so we're learning again how to get even better at that, you know, how to wear masks properly, which masks we wear in different situations. A lot of people have the cloth masks, they're easy, they can be washed and reused, they're a, a, an economical option. They can be good because they can provide a good fit to the face, but they really should be at least two, better three layers. The finer the material, the better. That's why they don't allow scarves or, or other bandanas. It's important that it's fine material that acts as a filter and that they're really good face coverings. They cover the face well. Better, though, is, is a surgical mask. So that actually offers a better level of filtration with three layers that make up your standard surgical mask. The risk with those is sometimes they have big gapes at the side and so they don't fit so well. Fiddling with the um, ear loops can really help actually get a tighter fit on a mask so that you don't have it gaping around the edges. If you're actually in a situation where you're a bit more concerned that you're in close quarters with other people, you're going to be in that place for a while, actually layering your mask is a good idea because a cloth mask may not be the best filtration, but it can help hold a surgical mask in place if that's sitting over the top of it. The other sort you hear a lot more about now are the filtration masks or the respirators. So these are the P2 or the N95 masks. These are high filtration masks and they're designed to uh, reduce any, even tiny particles, you know, down to one micron. So theoretically, they should filter out the virus. So if you're on public transport, if you've got, you know, a 45 minute trip on a tram or a train or a bus, then that might be where you think, well, actually, I'm a commuter, I'm around other people I don't know, it is a closed space, so it's worth that extra investment. But the investment isn't just in buying the mask, it's also knowing how to wear it properly. They work 
if they're fully sealed. If it's gaping on your face at all, then it, it drops its effectiveness. You know, some people describe it as uncomfortable. Some people have skin irritations from it. So there'll be things that actually make it the right choice for some people and for other people, a bigger ask. And probably if they're more likely to fiddle with it, try and get it fitting more loosely so it's not irritating, losing the benefit. If you do reuse it, if you've used it for a full day and you're wearing it most of the day, probably shouldn't reuse it. But if you've only used it for a brief time, you can store it, keep it dry, sterilise it in sunshine. There are things you can do that actually make that reasonably safe as well. There's a lot of legacies that we're hoping for that, you know, from this pandemic that really do put us in a more resilient position going ahead, not just for COVID, but for other infectious diseases as well. Hopefully people won't go to work if they have symptoms. You know, we won't be sending kids to school with symptoms. There's things we've learned, but actually a cultural shift around masks is going to be an important part of that. We've seen it in other countries. It works really well in Asia. Now it's so broad across the community that I think people don't give a second look. And I think that's, that's important. That cultural shift hopefully means it's here to stay and that people who want to protect themselves, whether there's mask rules in place or not, opt for masks in those settings where it might just save them getting another winter cold. If you're a child of the 60s, chances are you had a hula hoop. But who put hips and hoop together in the first place? I did a little research. If that's feeling solid and flat and comfortable and like you're like, yeah, I'm nailing it tonight, pop your feet together and push harder. No surprises that the ancient Greeks wore onto it. They exercised with hoops to tone their abs. And the Hawaiians, well, they had hip moves down to a fine art. But it was right here in the land of Oz that it all came together. Imagine there's a chocolate coated strawberry stuck to the wall and you're just like, mine. When an American entrepreneur saw Aussie kids playing with timber hoops, bam, the plastic cooler hoop was born. And 60 years later, the hips are still swiveling. Because what happens is if the knees are going, it's like the hoop's going to go to where the party's at. Woo, woo, woo. Yeah, so we want to get the party more up here. Yeah, less circling. My name's Donna Sparks, and I like to call myself the Hoop Honcho. Oh, I love that. <laughs> All right, welcome to tonight's class. We are going to be covering things beginning with the letter W tonight. So we're going to be looking at waist hooping, weaves and wedgies and whatever else happens. So how do you describe it to someone who's curious? Is it a full body workout? Is it cardio? Like what kind of a workout is it? Most people assume that it's mainly working with the belly because when people think about hooping, they think of waist hooping. Mm. But there's so many moves that you can do on different parts of your body with your arms out or with your legs or holding different shapes that it ends up being not just core, it's legs, it's arms, it's all of the supporting muscles across the upper and lower back. Grip strength gets really good, so you can end up having these crazy forearm muscles just because you're holding a hoop in this way. And we're going side, 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 side. Strong body, strong belly. It's not like doing reps at the gym where you're like, give me another 10 and you're sort of fighting this battle. It's like, oh, just play here for a little longer and try this for a little longer and suddenly you can do something and it felt like play rather than struggle. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a giggle in it that doesn't exist elsewhere. <laughs> Everyone do this for a minute. Keep the hand in. <laughs> Lead with the elbow down. The playfulness is something that I want to bring more of that into my life. So this is definitely playful. And I think when you're older, it's good to do new things that are out of your comfort zone. So that's definitely, I'm in that category. When this arm's up, as it comes down, that's the cue for this one to go. So it's like switch. Yeah, so you're going to go dominant arm switch, almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're going to. It's addictive. It's it like anything. And once you get like those few couple moves that you get a flow, like a combo, and mm. you get that feeling where you actually feel like it's like a solidified move, you, um, yeah, you just feel like really good about yourself that you've been able to like piece the little puzzles together. Yeah. yeah. I would have thought that this was easy, but looking at it now, I don't think I'd go very well. <laughs> Requires a lot more core than I ever imagined. Eyes up, chest up, heart open, 
body strong, belly on. I think we take exercise very seriously sometimes, but you guys look like you were having the best time. Yes, I felt like every time I get the hula hoop going, I feel like I'm seven again. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just in a room of seven-year-old girls and we're all having a giggle and having fun and falling about laughing. Go, 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 go! People should come to hoop class because it's fun fitness, it's meditative, it lands you back in your body, it quiets the mind, and I feel like there's this nice balance between like challenge and achievement, which is, I guess, what creates flow. Well, today's been all about celebrating women, Joe. those close to us and those who inspire us from afar. We might not be there just yet, but I think we're heading in the right direction towards gender equality and something I know you're incredibly passionate about. Absolutely. It's all about providing women with more opportunities and empowering us to step into our own space as well, talking about the things that matter. And do you know what the hot topic in female health is right now? What's that? It's menopause. Yep, out of my... Uh... Job description, Joe. <laughs> Although, you know what, I think every man who's in a relationship with a woman should know all about menopause. I'm sure that you've got lots I'm to listening. learn. I'm listening, I'm <laughs> listening. Well, there is a stigma about talking about it, but that is changing, thankfully. By 2025, there will be over 1 billion women experiencing menopause. So that's 12% of the world population. The global menopause wellness market is estimated to become a $600 billion industry. So think about it. Millennials born from around 1980 to 1995 are hitting their 40s, which is when perimenopause starts to kick in. Gen Xs are already there, so it's a massive market. I'm going to buy shares in menopause health, honestly. I'm really excited for you, Joe. <laughs> I'm money listening. To be made. I'm learning. <laughs> now, I've said it many times before women and what their bodies do is absolutely incredible, which seems like the perfect ending to the show. Don't miss Joe's incredible interview with Kemi Nekvapil on Broad Radio next Tuesday. Just head to broadradio.com.au for all the details. And, of course, you can always hear me with Gerald Quickly on the House of Wellness radio show every Sunday. And thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time.